Good evening, everyone. I am Samir Turde. I'm happy to welcome you all to uh, the regular public talks that happen at Ayuka. Uh, although you see the response is less, but the uh, the topic is quite exciting, and uh, we uh, usually get you some very uh, frontline uh, working scientists, either from or from other fields, to present science with their own perspective uh, to you, so that you can appreciate it better. Or if you are interested in the field, you can also probably uh, take a choice of whether you want to follow it up or not. So uh, today we have, uh, in fact, this week at Ayuka we have a special uh, school going on uh, in which uh, data science in astronomy is getting covered and uh, a lot of undergraduate students are attending it. And uh, for that we have uh, Professor Ashish Mahabhar who is visiting Ayuka and he's from the California Institute of Technology in the USA. And, uh, as a, as a, for a brief introduction, he's an astronomer and a data scientist. So that's a great combination because uh, if the, as, you, as the world goes forward in uh, progress in astronomy, there's a lot of telescopes, many automated telescopes coming up, which uh, require all the data to be processed. So he's leading some of the efforts, uh, some of the telescopes which are doing sky surveys, etc. They require such uh, help from AI, from machine learning, etc. Also, he's a leading scientist in that field. But his connection with Ayuka is quite uh, old, and he, his PhD is from here. He's originally from Nagpur, where he did his uh, masters in uh, physics, engineering, and mathematics. And then he joined here for PhD. So he's he's been at Ayuka, and uh, he uh, went on uh, after '98. Uh, I suppose he went on to. Uh, the USA, and now he's a uh, he's a professor at the California Institute of Technology. So he's here to uh, tell us something that we can do ourselves, and how can we contribute to astronomy. So it's quite going to be quite interesting. And we are looking forward to how to use ZARP to catch a supernova. So let's welcome Professor Mahabur. Thank you for the warm welcome, Samir. And. Uh, as Samir said, my name is Ashish Mahabal. I'm from Caltech, and today we are going to talk a little bit about ZART and how to catch a supernova. So let me start uh, by asking how many of you have an Android, because that's going to play a role later on. How oh, many of you? That's excellent. So uh, we'll see uh, going ahead how that plays an important role in that. And so something that you may want to do is that you may want to scan the QR code, perhaps, that you see there. That will take you to the website for Zarth, and then you'll be able to uh, download the game which will be playing later on. So I'll give you half a minute to do that. So that's our emblem for Zarth. All right. So this is the broad outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about how astronomy has been changing, what sky surveys are, go a little bit into those details, few different source types that we find in the sky. Then uh, the data sparsity in astronomy. So you have heard a lot about how there is a lot of data in astronomy. That's in general true. But then given an individual object, there's not too much data available on that and how we need to use the minimum amount of data that we have to classify things, to understand the universe and all those things. Then I'll talk about the Zwicky transient facility. Specifically, uh, this is the survey for which I do machine learning. I lead the machine learning for that. And I'll introduce you to transients. So but in short, transients are objects that change in brightness in a relatively short amount of time. So if you go outside and look at the night sky, you know how to differentiate between planets and stars. Planets don't twinkle, they seem steady because they're extended sources. And even if the light comes to the atmosphere because of their extended nature, you don't see them shimmering. Whereas stars, because they're point sources, even if they're much bigger than planets, they're so far away that they look like points. They're practically like points. And so when they come through atmosphere, there is uh, different layers of atmosphere at different temperatures. So because of the shimmering, you see them differently. 
But there are additional differences that happen. So for instance, most of the stars that you see at night outside are not going to change much in our lifetimes. They have really long lifetimes and they are fairly steady. If they were not steady, for instance, if the sun were not steady, there would not be life on planets around the sun. We couldn't exist if stars were not steady. And it is something that goes hand in hand. So the stars are steady, there can be planets around them, there can be life on those planets, etc. Right? But transients are objects that change rapidly, relatively speaking. So some examples are supernovae, which is in the title of this talk. So a supernova is a star which is at the end of its life, it explodes and dies. And that's one possibility. But there are other interesting examples like a tidal disruption event. A tidal disruption event is a star that comes too close to the central black hole of a galaxy and gets ripped apart. And so it dies a spectacular death. Or there are AGNs, active galactic nuclei. So these quasars, for instance, these are centers of galaxies that are so bright because of the light emission that you see from them that they outshine the entire galaxy. So some external galaxies which have 10 raised to 11 stars, the single central source is brighter than all the 10 raised to 11 stars. And those can undergo changes, they can become brighter and so on. And then there are other stars within our galaxy, uh, which for instance, there are binary stars that are changing or there are flaring stars. So even if I said that the sun is fairly constant, you have heard of solar spots and solar storms. So once in a while, where there, when there is a flare from the sun, what happens is that the electronic equipment in orbit can get shut down because of that cell uh, communication, cell phone communication can be disrupted, etc. Recently, India launched uh, Aditya and it's going to be taking continuous observations of the sun and so on. So we'll know much more about the sun. So the sun is steady in general, but there are tiny flares that do happen and those affect. So aurora that you see from the northern hemispheres, northern parts, northern latitudes, those are again because of solar activity interacting with Earth's atmosphere, etc. But there are other stars which change in brightness much more spectacularly. So for instance, there are flaring stars that can flare up a total of 100 times their own brightness in a matter of minutes or hours. So if the sun were to do that, we would become toast immediately, right? It's good that the sun doesn't become that. One day it may, whatever, right? But so those are transients in general. So objects that change in brightness in a short amount of time. And what many sky surveys do, in particular, our sky survey does that, that we are looking for these objects. Because even if most stars, 90% of the stars are constant and only 10% of the stars show some kind of variability because we observe a billion stars. So 10% of a billion is a fairly large number, right? We get to see them. And every night we find about 100,000 transients, 100,000 objects that change in brightness. And then what we do, the app that I'm going to show you is that we select about 200 of those and put in that app. So every night we put new transients onto the app, which you can catch. Have you heard of Pokemon Go? Raise your hand if you have. Many of you have, great. So Think of Zarth as Pokemon Go, but for astronomy. So you can catch transients like Pokemon Go. The game mechanics is slightly different, of course, but we'll talk about that in a bit. And then what is important for that uh, in general is understanding what light curves and cutouts are. A light curve essentially is a time series, how an object changes in brightness. So in astronomy, it's called a light curve. And finally, we'll come to Zarth that I already mentioned. All right, <clears throat> so how is astronomy changing? So in the old times when we didn't have telescopes and so on, the nights used to be much darker. You could see more stars, a few thousand at a time likely. And then older astronomers, they were astrologers at the time because that they were intertwined at the time. What they would see is the retrograde motion. And that is how they were able to figure out there are a few planets and many stars. And that, that was the main distinction that they could have. And then slowly as things progressed, they were able to figure out that there are island universes, galaxies or nebulae, which may have more stars perhaps. And then how to differentiate between stars and galaxies. And then we learned about quasars, what I told you about centers of some galaxies, which are really, really bright. So what has been happening over the last few decades is that we have gone from few observations to many observations. And by many, I mean many hundreds. So in some sense, from slow snapshots, we have gone to looking at movies of the sky. So when I went to Caltech in 99, they were finishing a project called DPOS, the Digitized Palomar Observatory Sky Survey. That was the time when 
even astronomers used to use photographic plates. So at the back of the telescope, there wouldn't be a computer to which a CCD would be connected, but there would be a photographic plate, just like we used to have those cameras with shutters, right? So the photographic plate would be exposed for an hour. And once you have an hour long exposure, you would have brightness the level of about 20th magnitude or so on. So we'll get to what that means um, in a little bit. But what that would mean is that uh, it would take a really long time for something to happen. So it took DPOS 15 years to do one survey of the sky. And then we can do an equivalent survey of the sky in three days now. So from 15 years to three days. And individual exposures used to be one hour long, now they are 30 seconds long for the same thing. And of course we can take deeper images which will take us to deeper uh, parts of the sky, etc. So we also moved from plates to CCDs. And then we also have observatories in the sky. You would have heard of uh, Hubble Space Telescope and then there is JWST that was recently launched. But both these telescopes are not sky survey telescopes. They look at small parts of the sky. They can go to great depths. But there are other surveys like other uh, observatories like Kepler and Gaia and TESS, which are for all sky observations. So we can take observations from outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And the advantage of that is that the shimmering that I mentioned doesn't come into picture. So we can get crisper objects, crisper images, and that's really, really important. And then all this has led to much more data, the volumes of data that we have. So the Zwicky Transient Facility, which we currently have, it has more than one petabyte of data. So 1,000 gigabytes is a terabyte, 1,000 terabytes is a petabyte. So that's the volume more than that actually that we have gathered so far. So what that means is that when we have these sky surveys and very large volumes of data, we cannot look at all the data ourselves. That is, even if we combine all the humans on Earth, forget just the small number of astronomers, you cannot look at the data. So you need machines to look at them. And that is why machine learning has come into vogue. And of course, having GPUs and faster processing and internet has really helped a lot, right? And so that's where we are going into. So some of the sky surveys, I already mentioned DPOS. SDSS was another sky survey that laid the foundation for a lot of data science activities because they had all their, uh, the way they designed their database and so on was in a modern way and they collected data very meaningfully and analysis was done. And that was really the start of astronomy at the sky survey level that was very methodical. And then there were many uh, sky surveys that came since then. I worked on this one called the CRTS, the Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey. The main intent of the Catalina Sky Survey was to look for near Earth asteroids. So what they would do is that they would take four images of the same part of the sky within 30 minutes. So you go to a part of the sky, take an image, go somewhere else, come back, take another image, take a third image, and then take a fourth image. The reason is that they were looking for asteroids. So they were looking for moving objects. So in the first three images, they would look for objects that moved. Then using that, they would extrapolate the observations and predict where the fourth one would be seen. And then they would confirm that that is where it was seen. So they were looking only for asteroids. What we said at Caltech is that why don't we take the data and look for transients? And we started doing that in real time. So that was the first survey in which systematically transients were looked at. And then we started publishing those in real time also. So there's so much data that you cannot keep all the data to yourself. That doesn't make much sense. So what we would do is that we'd start publishing this. And then who had wanted to observe that uh, could go and observe that of course. And then TESS I mentioned that is for the exoplanets that has very large pixels. But then the advantage of TESS is that it can sit on a very large part of the sky for one month. So continuous observations for one month in uh, one location. So I mentioned about sparsity earlier. Astronomical data tends to be very sparse. So <coughs> with ZTF for instance, we look at the entire northern sky every three nights. But in five years, there are about 1800 days. And if you look at Every three days in 1800 days, that's still only 600 observations, right? And 600 observations each of 30 seconds. So compared to the length of the five years time period, the total amount of time we are looking at that object is really, really tiny. And so we don't get enough information. But with something like TESS, what you can do is that you can sit on that object for one month continuously. So every two minutes you get a new data point. 
And that means that you can look at small variations very quickly. The disadvantage there is that their pixels are large, so there can be more confusion. So you have to do more things to make sure that you are looking at the object that you are looking at. And ZTF, I'll mention more about that later. So we essentially are going from hundreds to thousands of observations, billions of sources. And the, one of the main things that we have been trying to push for is understanding changes. The static sources will be there, but the 10% sources that are changing, we want to understand them better and better, what is happening there. So here is an example of gravitational uh, wave observation. So gravitational wave observatories like, there are two observatories like observatories in the US, there is one in Italy and one is going to come up in India, in Maharashtra in fact, not far from Hingoli in a few years time. So what these do is that these are not electromagnetic waves that they're observing, but they're looking at changes because of masses, things that are, so for instance, when two black holes coalesce or two neutron star coalesce, then there is a ripple that affects the almost the rest of the universe and we can catch them with very sensitive observations here. And then the observations are sensitive but the localization is not very good. So we end up finding that it's somewhere in there or somewhere in there that the object is and that is what is shown by these images. And this is just a rectangular uh, representation of that area. So let's talk about a few different source types. I already mentioned a few like supernovae and TDs and active galactic um, nuclei, but there are also pulsating stars. So stars that are just breathing in some sense, and uh, that is because of that, the, their brightness keeps changing. So they, the RR Lyrae stars, for instance, have a sawtooth appearance because of that. So it's not a sinusoidal change that you always see. So sometimes they become brighter quickly and over a longer period fade, and then again become brighter and over a longer period fade. But you do see these repeating observations that way. And then there are many, many binary stars the binary stars are the ones where you see extrinsic variability. So two stars that are going around each other and when there is an eclipse, uh, you remove, you cannot see the light of the star behind and then the other star can eclipse the first. And of course, if it is in the plane of your eyesight, it's clear eclipses, but there can be also, uh, it can, the whole thing can be at an angle to you when the eclipses are not complete. So the variations can be more nuanced or just like there are solar spots, many of these stars have star spots, and because of that also you see variations in the stars. So there are many, many possibilities. And what we have been looking at are also outliers, looking at things that don't fit in these patterns. So you start by looking at all the light curves, look at various binary classifiers. So these binary classifiers, each classifier asks, well, is this an RR Lyrae star? Is this a Cepheid star? Is this a supernova? And so on. And then, so we carry all those confidences and we understand what are variables and then we run a few different algorithms to look for outliers. And then we find out common outliers and then take spectra and figure out what those are and so on. So these are the different ways in which you can look for objects that are changing, try to classify them and so on. But there are so many out there that you cannot fully classify everything as yet. It's going to take some time before we get to that point. <clears throat> so we'll see some examples of uh, some objects now. This is, for instance, a tidal disruption event. So that's the star that came too close to the black hole and got ripped apart. And you can see how, um, you can see it has this tail. And depending on what your angle is, you can see the brightness varying rapidly and then fading over time as it goes away. Or then, <coughs> this is an active galactic nuclei. Here, there is an accretion disk and there is a very bright central source and then there is a brightness that's perpendicular to the accretion disk. And depending on where you are looking at it, it can seem very different. So what is shown here is depending on the angle that you look at, it can show itself as either a blazar or a quasar or Cipher type one or Cipher type two galaxy and so on. So again, not exactly like the elephant and blind people, but because of our line of sight, it can seem different. And then with that limited data, we need to understand what those things are doing. Or in this case, uh, Cepheids and RR Lyrae, which are pulsating variables. So here. So these stars are periodic changes in luminosity. Delta City is among the few stars that have a period of luminosity. Here's his light curve showing luminosity changes over time. 
the pattern is quite brilliant. So what we saw there was how it changes every five days. And the pulsations that were shown in the image, they were seen clearly. We don't see that with the naked eye because those pulsations are happening at a much fainter level, fainter than what our naked eye can see. So the magnitude scale, for those of you who don't know, the way it works is that when we evolved, whatever stars we saw, we roughly put them from zeroth magnitude to fifth magnitude. All our devices, our ear, our eyes, these have logarithmic responses. So the zeroth magnitude is roughly 100 times brighter than the fifth magnitude. So five magnitudes is 100 times difference. So from five to 10, 10 to 15, and 15 to 20 is 15 magnitudes. So about 100 times 100 times 100 equal to million times fainter. So what you can see with the naked eye, what ZTF can see is roughly a million times fainter than that in 30 seconds. And some of the variation, that was not exactly 20th magnitude, but definitely fainter than fifth magnitude. And that's why when you go out at night, you don't see those pulsations, but they are there in many, many objects. Here's an example of uh, eclipsing stars now. <clears throat> Right, so that's how you can see how the light changes for binary stars. Here is an extreme example of <coughs> uh, dwarf nova, where what you can see here on the x-axis is time, this is in days, and on the y-axis is again brightness. And this small portion has been zoomed in here, and this small portion has been magnified here and this small portion has been magnified there. And you can see that for the same star, how it can look very different depending on when you are looking at it. It doesn't happen with all kinds of objects. This is not a very common type. There are many, enough of them, of course, but not every star does that. But again, this shows that depending on when you are observing, how it can look different, and you need to be able to gather different types of data to be able to say what is what many times. Right, so uh, I gave this uh, jungle safari analogy a couple of times earlier, where what you do is that if you have gone to a forest looking for animals and you try to look continuously everywhere looking for different kinds of animals. But what astronomy is doing because of the limited resources, it's like going to a jungle but keeping your eyes closed for five minutes, opening them for half a second, looking in another direction, keeping them closed for five minutes, opening for another half second. So that's the kind of observing that we are doing. And within that, whatever we see, if we don't get eaten, of course, then we can do astronomy in this format, right? So. Let's uh, talk a little bit about ZTF, the transient facility that I mentioned for which I did the machine learning. So this is a 1.2 meter telescope. So it's, so it's not big in that sense, right? 1.2 meters is uh, fairly small. But the interesting thing about this is that it has a very large field of view. It has a field of view of 47 square degrees. For comparison, the moon, its diameter is half a degree. Same as the sun, and that's why we can have both eclipses, uh, solar and lunar. So the area of the sun or the moon is roughly quarter square degree, which means that you can fit 200 full moons within a single image of CTF. So that's how big a single image is. And we use these tiles to tile the entire northern sky. So several hundred of these tiles. That's how we can observe the entire northern sky every three nights. We go to about 20.5 magnitudes in 30 seconds. We use GRI filters. These are different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. 1.4 terabyte data nightly, roughly 20,000 square degree every two nights in GRI. Sort of. And so the number of sources that we have been observing is fairly large. And most of these data are publicly available. You can download those and do lots of things. So using GR and I filters, these are the number of 
sources that we have, and these are the number of apertures that we have, fairly large numbers, I'm not going to try to read them. But that should give you an idea as to over five years, how much data we have collected. In fact, this is an older DR. We have had later releases after that. So just to show that there's a lot, and a lot of data that we have there. And so the thing that we are trying to get to is come to make something like this tree or try to classify everything into a specific object. And even this tree is not complete. So here, for instance, we have extrinsic variability and intrinsic variability. Extrinsic variability will be like asteroids that move or rotate or binary stars that we talked about. So because of uh, eclipsing or micro lensing or even rotation when you see because of rotation changes. Whereas intrinsic variability is where something like a mini explosion or a full blown explosion is happening. And within that again, you've got AGNs, which are radio loud or radio quiet, or within stars that are eclipsing, eruptive, cataclysmic, pulsating, secular, and so on. And you can see that how many of the branches have many, many sub branches. And we'd like to understand all of these branches. And that is where we need better and better observations. And that is where what we try to do is that try to look at sky in multiple filters, try to look at them in multiple times, because many of these are periodic. Some of them are short periods, like several tens of minutes, whereas some of them are hundreds of days. So there's a huge variety in there, and we'd like to understand all of that. So the primary currency of what we do is this alert packet. When we look at the night sky again and again, what we do is that we have generated reference images from older data. And then we compare the latest images that we take with the reference images. And the difference is what you see here, for instance. This is our reference image. This is the data that would have taken on some specific night. We subtract the two after matching them correctly, and then we get this. Now, this is a specific part that I have focused, but our actual image, as I told you, is a huge one. So what we do, what our algorithms do, is look for areas where after the brightness, after the subtraction, you do see changes. And then those are the cutouts that we make around them. And then at that location, because we have past images also, we go and look at all the brightness at that point. And this is the light curve that you get. So you can see zero is tonight or whatever night when this data were taken, and then up to 30 days or whatever days before how the brightness of that object were changing. And these are 63 by 63 images. So these alert packets are then sent out. They are broadcast. And whoever is subscribing to those alerts can receive those. And every night, we find of the order of 100,000 objects that change in brightness. Some of them are variable that are repeating. Some of them are AGN. Some of them are supernovae. Some of them are TDE, and so on, the tidal disruption events, and so on. <clears throat> and then we provide a lot of metadata. RA and DEC, for instance, tell you what part of the sky they are in or these are the magnitudes, what the brightness is, and how they are changing, et cetera. So lots and lots of different things that we have. And we also get data from some other catalogs that exist at the same location and provide that also for comparison. Because again, our observations are limited to a few brightness areas, few parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. There may be infrared observations, ultraviolet observations, radio observations, and so on. So we provide some of those as well. And so that brings me to Zarth now. Right? So ZARTH stands for, the Z stands for ZTF, which itself stands for Zwicky Transient Facility. The AR stands for Augmented Reality, and TH stands for Transient Hunter. So this is our game where we allow you to hunt for transients. We put the transients in the game, and then you can go looking for them in the sky and catch them. So every day, fresh transients from ZTF are added to ZARTH, provided ZTF took data the previous night, if because of weather or some other reason ZTF didn't take data, right now we are not putting any data, but we are also going to be putting variables at that time. And every day new data sets are put at zero UTC, so which corresponds to, I think, 6.30 a.m. for India, or 5.30 a.m., 5.30 a.m. in India. So that's the time when new data uh, get put every day. So if you wake up at the time and look for transients, you'll find new transients there. So this idea came to us from Pokemon Go. I was thinking about this several years ago, that there is a huge variety in Pokemon. There are bug Pokemon and dark Pokemon and dragon Pokemon and so on. And I thought, these are not too different from what we saw here, right? There are different kinds of stars. So if there is a Pokemon Go, why not make something like uh, Astronomy Go? And that's where 
what we did is that uh, with the help of some undergraduate student, we made a rudimentary app, but then we soon realized that how it's not a trivial thing to do. You need very persistent things uh, to go around about that and so on. So then it was in the last couple of years that we developed this app with the help of these three undergraduate students. Uh, one is from Caltech, one is from IIT Mandi, and one is from IIT Gandhinagar. And then there were many other people who helped uh, with this app, of course. And so what we'll uh, do, I'll describe to you a few of these things and then I'll demo the app itself to you. What you have is, uh, the Sky Map is an app that is available on Androids. There's also an equivalent version available on iPhones, but the iPhone version is not open source. That is why we started then working with the Android version because that is the version that we changed. So on the top of Sky Map then, so these are the layers that you have in Sky Map for Androids. In Sarth, we have added this icon, which is the icon for transients that we have. So, <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned, we find of the order of 100,000 transients every day. And if we were to put all of them, if you move your phone around, you'll see nothing but the transients, and then you'll just curse us, right? So what we did is that we sparsified those data and picked up to 200 of those, and that is why, and that is what we put in. So, for instance, um, when you go to smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer, this is the kind of distribution that you would have which would go into the sky. And then what we did is that we decided that we will put a few different kinds of transients. There are six types of transients that are in Zarth right now. So there are hosted transients. What that means is that there is a galaxy associated with those transients. So it could be a supernova or it could be an AGN or it could be a tidal disruption event. Then there are orphan transients where there is no obvious galaxy associated with that. So it could be still associated with some galaxy which is far too faint, but it could also be a star within our galaxy that has become brighter for whatever reason. And then there are nuclear transients. So these are also associated with galaxies, but these are closer to the center of the galaxy. So more likely to be an AGN or TD, but it could also be a supernova that is close to the center of the galaxy. And then there are variable stars. So the big variability tree that we saw so we are putting all variables from there into a single category. We are, for now, not subclassifying them. So you can see all kinds of things. But we do provide the light curve. So using the light curve, when you see a variable, you may be able to tell for yourself or figure out what that object is. And then we also made some magnitude ranges. So there are a few from that are brighter than 15th magnitude, few that are fainter than 20th magnitude, but most of the ones that are intermediate are the ones that we keep here. And so, this transient catching doesn't come free. You don't have to pay money. You have to pay through credits. We give you free credits every day. But the reason we have those points is that we have made, put in some Easter eggs in the game as well. So every day at zero UTC, not only are new transients put in, but your credits are reset to 2000. So if you have not spent your credits by zero UTC the previous night, those are going to go west and you get new 2,000 free credits anyway. And then you spend those credits to try to catch transients, and for every transient caught, you get a few points. And those points are different. So for supernovae, for variables, you'd get different points. For hosted, you'd get different points. And how, depending on how rare the object is, you're going to get different number of points as well. Plus, there are things like uh, we have used the knapsack algorithm so that given the 2,000 credits on a given night, you are told what's the maximum number of points that you can reach. And then maybe you can play against the game trying to reach as close to that number of points as well. And so this is how the main screen looks. Uh, when you enter, you have to sign in with your Google sign in. You have to create an account for you, not an account really, but just give yourself a name. And if the name is already used, then you cannot use that name, you cannot use spaces, so there are a few things like that. We don't save any of your information, we don't ask for any other information, but to play the game, of course, you'll need the location permissions to be given, otherwise it won't know where you are, the accelerator won't be synced and so on. And the transients that you catch, the light curves and the cutouts for them, those are saved in the gallery for yourself, so you need to give it uh, permissions to save to your phone, etc. And when you come in, there is a short algorithm that tells you what kind of transients there are hosted, orphan, nuclear, variable, and then there are three or four screens which you go through doing next. This is also available through these menu that you can access through the three dots, and if you go to about Zarth or guide, you get more details about the app as well. 
So at this type maybe, and then, so these are the four types, and then there are two wild types or ambiguous types. So we run many classifiers, as I mentioned, binary classifiers. So we have an assai classifier that asks whether a particular object is a variable or not, one that asks is it's a hosted or not, right? And then sometimes, because these binary classifiers are independent of each other, two of them can claim the object. The hosted one can say it is a hosted, and the nuclear one can say it is nuclear source. So in which case, it can get put into the ambiguous type or some something can be called an orphan and a variable at the same time for some reason. And so those are the kinds of things that we'd like to understand. But right now it is only for outreach. We are not expecting data back from you. At some point we may convert this into citizen science at which point you may be able to directly contribute to the science. But for now you can just learn, you can start these as competitions. If there are teachers among you, you can start these as small <coughs> friendly competition within the classrooms, etc. So at this point, maybe what we should do is that we should actually do a demo. And uh, what I'm going to do is that connect, hook up a phone to this. And so we can uh, look at it. That way you can see how things are. And maybe some of you can try to play along with it as well. <coughs> so you can take these couple minutes if you're not to maybe make accounts for yourself and go to the main screen. How many of you have downloaded and have reached the first part of it? A few of you, that's great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So I play Zarth every day. I try to do that. And as happens, three days back, my phone died completely. So I cannot play Zarth. So Prasad has helped me out with his phone. And this is what we are seeing right now. So with Zarth, what happens is that once you go in, as you move <coughs> the phone, you're going to see the appropriate part of the sky. And this is great to identify stars and look at planets and so on also, of course. And so I'm seeing that the sun is somewhere there and the moon is not far from it. And I should maybe keep it like this. OK. So one of the things that you can do if you're not finding any transient is if you click on the screen, then this menu comes up. And here what you can see is there are a few things that I can point out in the menu. So these are the credits that you have. And these are the points that you have. And this is the streak, how many consecutive number of days that this person has been catching transients for now. This is the menu that I mentioned. And this is what you can click on and off to uh, change the transients, whether they are seen or not. And these are a few menus that are connected to leaderboard, what your gallery is, et cetera. And this is the one that will allow you to get to the menu. But you also see that there is this lens symbol. If you're not seeing any transients, what you can do is that you can click there. And then when a menu comes up, if you type T there for transient, or you can type the whole word transient, of course, and then go to next, then what will happen is that it'll tell you in which direction you need to move to look for the transient, at least one transient, a transient. OK, I think it keeps going. Where is it sending me? OK, that's the transient that it was looking for, right? And then I can get rid of that. So if, I, if you can't find transient by just turning the phone, you can do this. And then of course, uh, when you touch that transient, then this screen comes up. And on this screen, what you are being told, what is the magnitude of that object? What is its type? This is the name, ZTF name for it. And you can find more information using that later on also. This is the cost for catching that object. And these are the number of points that you'll get for catching that object. And this is the symbol icon that you can use for catching. But what you can also do is that before catching, if you want to go and find out more information, because remember the Easter egg where you can try to optimize your catches. You don't want to catch perhaps every transient that you can. So if I click on more info, then this is where I'm going to see the cutout. So this is the reference image. This is the science image. And this is the difference image. And this is an interesting transient. It's a hosted transient, right? So very likely it's a supernova. And you can see how about 50 days back it started becoming brighter. And then it became, went up to 17th magnitude and started fading after that. 
right? <coughs> so why was it called a transient at this point? Because the reference image that we had was still somewhere here. And so the difference between this brightness and this brightness was large enough that it was called a transient again last night. And that is what you can see from this date, right? This from last night that you saw. And then uh, here is a little bit more information. TNS tells you that the transient name server has one spectrum for this object. Whenever an object has a spectrum, that means that the astronomers find something interesting about that object. So it's likely to be interesting and people are likely to follow it. So you are likely to get more points because of that. The rarity for this object is 0 0.74. And again, you can use this icon to catch the transient. You can use this icon to share it. You can send it by mail or with WhatsApp or in whichever way things can be shared. So if you do you know, click on the <coughs> button, then you're told that it's being caught and then you'll be told that it's been caught. It's lagging a little bit at this point. Yeah, here it's done. And then uh, the screen that you have here, right? This, this is the where you can see the various leaderboards, etc. So the rightmost icon brings up, has it stopped sharing because it's not moving there? Okay, now I think it is maybe. <coughs> I'm seeing different screens here and there. Okay, there you go. So uh, this is the current leaderboard and the leaderboard is updated uh, per transient, but we have two leaderboards. One is a weekly leaderboard, which is reset every Friday evening. So between, I think, uh, so uh, Saturday morning here, it will be reset and you'll have a new set of weekly leaders, which we post on the Caltech website. So whatever your <coughs> pseudo name is, you can see that, <coughs> excuse me. And then here what you can have is that for each type of transient, you have these different leaders that can be seen that are there. And then you can go back to hunting. And then the next button here was the leaders who have been leading. So there are some people who have got close to a million points, for instance, but it's easy to catch up. It's not that difficult. So don't let that dissuade you. And then the third from the right is where the gallery is. So the objects that you have caught, you can see them, you can move through them, right? And you can now, so in some phones, in my phone, it stored it only for one week, but that may be because of some local settings, for instance. And then this, the fourth one from the left shows you what your collection is, how many you have been catching and so on. So, and you also get these badges, which you can uh, know more about from the, <coughs> about badges or share the badges as well. <coughs> So when you collect, uh, click on that, you are allowed to share it in different ways. <coughs> and then what you have is this tells you the second symbol from the left. It tells you today's collection. <coughs> so today, for instance, there are 17 hosted, total 89. There is no wild type one today and 10 wild type two. So the wild type one are the rarest ones. There are not too many of those normally, <coughs> typically one or two. And then what you have is you have help from the question mark. So it tells you what uh, Zarth for Android overall is. And then if you go to the three dots up here, that's the menu that will tell you about, about Zarth, the guide. And then there are various settings, for instance, there are haptic settings available. You can enable sound there, or you can disable Zarth bar. So the first pop-up and second pop-up, how long they stay. So that information also you can decide based on that. And then one more thing that is there is that this button here, it allows you to scroll without having to move the phone all along. So if I were to click on that, then yeah. slide it up. Okay, yeah, I think. So now if I move, I can move with my finger and the sky will change rather than having to, for me to point the phone in different directions. But of course, that's not the fun part, right? Because you know, you don't know which part of the sky you're looking at. So it's better if you were doing this and figuring that out. So that's more or less uh, what we have <clears throat> in the game, but you can explore <coughs> all the things that are 
in there, also in the menus in particular. So let's uh, come out of this uh, if we can. <coughs> right, and so what we have here now is you saw what these different things were. So you start with your login screen, choose a login name, give permissions, no personal data store. These are the different screens that you already saw. Oh, has this stopped moving now? Like, okay, maybe. And again, these are the movies, uh, the screens that you already saw. And these are the kinds of weekly leaders that we have been posting to the website, <clears throat> your names will be there. And then these are the different batches that are available for each type and for total and for one and 10 and 50 and so on, which you can share with other still people about this fascinating game. So many things are possible with this. There can be local collaborations and competitions, learning about light curves or different types of objects. You, for instance, in school or in the classroom, <clears throat> students can be told about one type of transient every week and have students catch only those. Reason about ambiguous sources, why certain sources are ambiguous. Batches actually, they're already here. We are improving them a little bit more. <coughs> and then you can, of course, share it with others and understand more. And maybe we'll get this on iPhone also. Uh, there's a student who is going to be working this summer, so either on iPhone or make it into a web app so that anyone who doesn't have a phone will also be able to use that. So with that, I would like to stop and be able to you know, take a few questions. So play Zarth, learn and spread the word. That's the ID that you can get in touch with and you have the phone also, so thank you. Hi, sir. Uh, this is Jay. Uh, my question is about the citizen science projects. Are there any more citizen science projects? Like recently, NASA has organized the uh, International Astronomical Search Campaign and the partner of uh, this Saptarshi organization, I think. So, are there any campaign? Right. So, when we started thinking about Zarth, we did want to make it into a citizen science project because that is where people can not only cash transients but be able to contribute. So the question that I asked, for instance, reason about ambiguous sources. If someone understands, so this is an ambiguous source for such and such reason, they should be able to come back and tell us because we cannot be looking at all these transients. So that should hopefully be coming at some point. Within ZTF, we do have a couple of other things to Zooniverse. And then this will be opened up for other surveys so different surveys can also have some similar mechanisms like Zarth, so they can also be catching transients related to that. So there will be opportunities in connection with citizen science. Right now we don't have that, but you can organize things within yourself and organize sites and do that as well. <coughs> yes, ZTF does have a couple of them there. Yeah. Hello sir, I wanted to ask whether those images are those real time or do you update them within like uh, after some days or? Right, so those are not real time in the sense those were not taken now for instance, but as I said at zero UTC they were updated. So they are from last night. So the, the one that is called <coughs> new, it would be from last night. Yeah, let's look at this one, right? So this is an older one, clearly, but what you're looking at it today. So that would be the latest, just from previous night. And this would be a reference image that is something that has been stacked over several nights. Because what we want to be able to do is that see if we were to take a deep image, how it will look. And a transient is a transient only if it seems brighter than a combined image in some sense. So it should be, it should have brightness that's <coughs> significantly above it. So not real time, but from previous night. And if the transient shows up again, then you will see a different image there. So like the supernova that we saw, there would be multiple new ones on different nights. So have you been able to catch any transients? Um, any of you who downloaded things? Okay. And so there'll be new ones every day, of course. And if you have any suggestions about 
features that you would like to see or in particular with gamification. So one of the biggest challenges with <clears throat> an app like this is that you don't just want people to look at them as a curiosity, but you would want them to keep coming back. And so typically things like batches and so on would be like that. But if you think of other things that would make you come back to it, we'd be happy to hear about it and if possible incorporate those into the game as well. As I said, we do want to incorporate this, make it in such a fashion that other surveys can also take this up. So this doesn't have to be a ZTF specific app, but other surveys can also use this. Yeah. So it's not open source yet because we are still finalizing it. The SkyMap part itself is open source. That is why we could build on top of that. But that's the idea that once we have uh, things that are fairly settled, then one would want to make it modular and open source. <coughs> would you be interested in developing on top of that? So you can always contribute. This is Java. And so the thing that we are thinking to bring it to iPhone is that there are some new languages which can work both for Androids and for iPhones like uh, Kotlin and Flutter and so on. So maybe use one of those. And if so, any of you expertise on that and want to contribute, please get in touch. Yes, right. No. Just a suggestion that uh, based on the points, they, they could be levels so that they uh, could get more exciting. People can go from level one to level two. Right, but exciting in what sense? Meaning what kind of? Uh... Just you said that uh, coming back is important. Right, I understand that. But meaning what would you like to see as a more exciting or more challenging opportunity to do? Uh, yeah, Sure, yes, meaning that idea, we, it had crossed our mind, but it's not trivial to make challenges uh, at the same time, right? But if you think of something, yes, please get in touch. There's one more. <clears throat> one thing could be like trying to ask them to identify what uh, that particular transient is, right? Yeah, but that involves citizen science part, right? That will involve us being involved in that, which we don't have enough um, bandwidth right now, but that was one of the ideas. I'm saying like, uh, for example, ZTM transients are taken by many um, other uh, brokers, right? Like mm -hmm. and so right. on. So they do give away, um, I mean, they do give some sort of classification. Right. So in principle, you could take things which have a classification, say from Antares at certain probability, mm -hmm. and then see if uh, the users are able to match you. Right, so bring in some additional classifications because right now what we are, right, yeah, but right now we are providing the classifications, right, meaning it's, uh, yeah, the type is already given. So the six types that we have, except for the ambiguous, the type to that granularity is already mentioned. But for instance, hosted on nuclear. But that's something that could be done that go into further granular thing. Um, my question is related to the surveys that through which we find the object. So once we have actually located a transient object, what is the next step? Like how do you further go into specifications of that? All right, that's a good question. So when you go into this more info, you do see this information here, right? And so if you enter this number into the ZTF website, it will give you a lot more information about the source. We did not want to include hyperlinks in here because <clears throat> that will take people away from the game right from there. But if people are interested, they can go to a computer or within their phone also be able to type that and be able to look up more information for those objects. So there's a lot of possibilities there. Black hole, so the, the hosted or the nuclear ones, if they are close to the center, maybe there is a black hole involved in that. We won't be able to see it with our naked eyes, of course, but there's a possibility that one of them involves one, right? All right, I guess there are no more questions. So happy hunting and get back in touch and play Zarth, spread the word, share.
right? If you're catching them, let other people know about this. Let them find out what's happening. Thank you.